Introduction Elementary Particle Physics Elementary Particle Physics addresses the question what is matter made of on the most fundamental level which is to say on the smallest scale of size it's a remarkable fact that matter at the subatomic level consists of tiny chunks with vast empty spaces in between even more remarkable these tiny chunks come in a small number of different types electrons protons neutrons pi mesons neutrinos and so on which are then replicated in astronomical quantities to make all the stuff around us and these replicas are absolutely perfect copies not just pretty similar like two folds coming off the same assembly line but utterly indistinguishable you can't stamp an identification number on an electron or paint a spot on it if you have seen one you have seen them all this quality of absolute identicalness has no analog in the macroscopic world in quantum mechanics it is reflected in the pauli exclusion principle it enormously simplifies the task of elementary particle physics we don't have to worry about big electrons and little ones or new electrons and old ones an electron is an electron is an electron it didn't have to be so easy my first job then is to introduce you to the various kinds of elementary particles the actors if you will in the drama i could simply list them and tell you their properties mass electric charge spin etc but i think it is better in this case to adopt a historical perspective and explain how each particle first came on the scene this will serve to endow them with character and personality making them easier to remember and more interesting to watch moreover some of the stories are delightful in their own right once the particles have been introduced in chapter 1 the issue becomes how do they interact with one another this question directly or indirectly will occupy us for the rest of the book if you were dealing with two macroscopic objects and you wanted to know how they interact you would probably begin by suspending them at various separation distances and measuring the force between them that's how coulomb determined the law of electrical repulsion between two charged pith balls and how cavendish measured the gravitational attraction of two lead weights but you can't pick up a proton with tweezers or tie an electron onto the end of a piece of string they are just too small for practical reasons therefore we have to resort to less direct means to probe the interactions of elementary particles as it turns out almost all our experimental information comes from three sources number 1 scattering events in which we fire one particle at another and record for instance the angle of deflection number 2 decays in which a particle spontaneously disintegrates and we examine the debris and number 3 bound states in which two or more particles stick together and we study the properties of the composite object Needless to say determining the interaction law from such indirect evidence is not a trivial task ordinarily the procedure is to guess a form for the interaction and compare the resulting theoretical calculations with the experimental data the formulation of such a guess model is a more respectable term for it is guided by certain general principles in particular special relativity and quantum mechanics 
In the diagram below, I have indicated the four realms of mechanics. The world of everyday life, of course, is governed by classical mechanics. But for objects that travel very fast at speeds comparable to sea, the classical rules are modified by special relativity. And for objects that are very small comparable to the size of atoms, roughly speaking, classical mechanics is superseded by quantum mechanics. Finally, for things that are both fast and small, we require a theory that incorporates relativity and quantum principles. Quantum field theory. Now, elementary particles are extremely small, of course, and typically they are also very fast. So, elementary particle physics naturally falls under the dominion of quantum field theory. Please observe the distinction here between a type of mechanics and a particular force law. Newton's law of universal gravitation, for example, describes a specific interaction, gravity, whereas Newton's three laws of motion define a mechanical system, classical mechanics, which within its jurisdiction governs all interactions. The force law tells you what F is in the case at hand. The mechanics tells you how to use F to determine the motion. The goal of elementary particle dynamics then is to guess a set of force law which within the context of quantum field theory correctly describe particle behavior. However, some general features of this behavior have nothing to do with the detailed form of the interactions. Instead, they follow directly from relativity from quantum mechanics or from the combination of the two. For example, in relativity, energy and momentum are always conserved, but rest mass is not. Thus, the decay delta 2 proton plus pi on is perfectly acceptable, even though the delta weighs more than the sum of proton plus pi on. Such a process would not be possible in classical mechanics where mass is strictly conserved. Moreover, relativity allows for particles of zero rest mass. The very idea of a massless particle is nonsense in classical mechanics. And as we shall see, photons, neutrinos and gluons are all apparently massless. In quantum mechanics, a physical system is described by its state S, represented by the wave function psi S in Schrodinger's formulation or by the ket S in Dirac's. A physical process such as scattering or decay consists of a transition from one state to another. But in quantum mechanics, the outcome is not uniquely determined by the initial conditions. All we can hope to calculate in general is the probability for a given transition to occur. This indeterminacy is reflected in the observed behavior of particles. For example, the charged pi meson ordinarily disintegrates into a muon plus a neutrino but occasionally one will decay into an electron plus a neutrino there is no difference in the original pi mesons they are all identical it is simply a fact of nature that a given particle can go either way finally the union of Relativity and quantum mechanics bring certain extra dividends that neither one by itself can offer. The existence of antiparticles, a proof of the Pauli exclusion principle, which in non-relativistic quantum mechanics is simply an ad hoc hypothesis, and the so-called TCP theorem, 
I will tell you more about these later on. My purpose in mentioning them here is to emphasize that these are features of the mechanical system itself, not of the particular model. Short of a catastrophic revolution, they are untouchable. By the way, quantum field theory in all its glory is difficult and deep, but don't be alarmed. Feynman invented a beautiful and intuitively satisfying formulation that is not hard to learn. We will come to that in chapter 6. The derivation of Feynman's rules from the underlying quantum field theory is a different matter, which can easily consume the better part of an advanced graduate course, but this need not concern us here. In the last few years, a theory has emerged that describes all of the known elementary particle interactions except gravity. As far as we can tell, gravity is much too weak to play any significant role in ordinary particle processes. This theory, or more accurately, this collection of related theories incorporating quantum electrodynamics the glasgow winberg salem theory of electroweak processes and quantum chromodynamics has come to be called standard model no one pretends that standard model is the final word on the subject but at least we now have for the first time a full deck of cards to play with since 1978 when the standard model achieved the status of orthodoxy, it has met every experimental test. It has moreover an attractive aesthetic feature. In the standard model, all of the fundamental interactions derive from a single general principle, the requirement of local gauge invariance. It seems likely that future developments will involve extensions of the standard model not its repudiation. This book might be called an introduction to the standard model. As that alternative title suggests, this is a book about elementary particle theory with very little on experimental methods or instrumentation. These are important matters and an argument can be made for integrating them into a text such as this, but they can also be distracting and interfere with the clarity and elegance of the theory itself. I encourage you to read about experimental aspects of the subject and from time to time I will refer you to particularly accessible accounts. For now, I will confine myself to scandalously brief answers to the two most obvious experimental questions.